Aiden sat in school, struggling to pay attention when the intercom came on in class. Aiden Roberts, please report to the front desk. He was so out of it that he barely realized that he'd been called out. But thankfully, the teacher made sure that he heard. He gathered his things, not sure the nature of the call, but when he reached the front office, he saw his mother standing there, holding back tears. She was there talking to the front office staff about some TV show when he walked in. As soon as his mother saw him, she quickly wrapped up the conversation and quickly went over to hug him. Naturally, he was confused. What's going on? Is everything okay? He inquired nervously. His mother never was this shook up, and she never came to school. But seeing her here in this condition made him nervous. It's your grandmother. We're not sure how much time we're going to have with her. He paused, generally confused. Aiden's dad's mom passed away five years ago, and he was forbidden to see his mom's mom, generally due to the result of some nonsense between his mom and grandma. Aiden could tell that his mom felt bad now, especially that her mom was on the brink of passing, and she spent all this time keeping them apart. The two then held hands and walked out to her car. In the car, she told him how her condition had gotten worse and that the doctors figured that she'd have another week or so. So why did you check me out of school? Are we going to see her? His mom was torn by the question. She was still struggling with all the past issues, but seeing how her mom was on her deathbed, all seemed to be forgiven, at least for the time being. The family's going to spend the rest of the week with her, all of us. Before he could give a complaint, his mother gave him a look, telling him that now was not the time. Aiden had plans, but it looked like those had just changed. The drive home, both of them were silent, neither of them wanting to converse about the situation. The two pulled into the driveway, seeing Aiden's father loading up the truck with suitcases and containers of food. It was evident that he was as thrilled as he was, going to have to spend a couple of days with his in-laws, that neither of them knew very well. Aiden had met his grandmother only once, but it had been some time. All he knew about her was that she lived out in the middle of nowhere, and for whatever reason, his mom didn't let them see her. Aiden got out of the car, and his father asked him to quickly pack for roughly a week or so. He quickly did so without protest, seeing how both his parents were either annoyed or saddened with the recent news. In a matter of 20 minutes, all three of them were packed up and on the road. None of them said a word. His father was trying to be supportive while his mother wrestled with her emotions. Aiden sat in the back playing with his Nintendo Switch. He made sure to have the volume off just in case his parents wanted to share some gossip, and so that he could listen. The family left the suburbs, past the city, and were now on the Lumsden Highway, with the occasional oncoming vehicle heading in the opposite direction. It had been a long three-hour drive when Aiden's mother started talking. Okay, so here's the deal. My mother's condition is quite severe. We don't think she's verbal anymore, and her mind is beyond repair. Make sure you're quiet around her. She's pretty docile for the most part, but don't startle her. As for Grandpa, make sure you're never alone with him. He doesn't like kids, or at least that's how it was when I last saw him. Also, the land that they live on is, well, no one's allowed outside without a parent. And by no means are you allowed to play in the woods. There's a lot of animals, and it's very easy to get lost. Do we have an understanding? Aiden glanced over his switch, to see his mother staring at him with somber eyes. Yes, Mama, he said softly while nodding his head. His parents continued talking, but not to him. Their hushed tones told him that whatever they were saying was important, but they didn't want him to hear. About five minutes later, the highway had a turnoff which they took and were now on a dirt road. Aiden could see down the dirt road and that empty fields lined both sides. At the end of the road, a good distance away, he was able to see a small farmhome. As they got closer, he was able to see behind the farmhouse that, sure enough, there were thick woods. Once they arrived, there was a single rusted brown Chevy truck parked out front, and an old man standing outside. 
His face was that of grief and solitude. We got out of the truck, and my mother embraced the man. Surely, this had to be my grandfather. Aiden's father shook his hand, but neither man said a word. The old man then turned to Aiden with his wrinkled face and cracked a toothy smile. You must be Aiden. It's been a while since I last saw you. He didn't hug him like he did his mother, nor shook his hand, but rubbed his worn leathery hand over his head, kind of like a pet. I suppose this was progress, he thought. They followed the old man inside to find the home incredibly dark. The light hurts her eyes, the old man said. Inside, we found that most of the home was lit by small candles. The temperature inside was the same as it was outside, thus still requiring a small jacket to be comfortable. The man led us around the house to finally an open room in which a figure stood in the corner. Immediately, Aiden knew that this must have been his grandmother. But she was concealed by a blanket she wore draping her entire body. Gail, we have visitors for you, the old man gruffed. Clearly, this was a phrase he hadn't said for quite some time. Unsurprisingly, the figure didn't turn. The phrase surely was incomprehensible to the figure. The old man then walked over slowly, making sure not to startle her, and gently turned her around to see the family. The dimly lit room did this woman no favors. Only her face was visible out of the blanket that covered her. Aiden wasn't sure what he expected her to look like, but it wasn't this. Her face was startling from what little he could see in the candlelight. Her milky white eyes clearly viewed nothing as she faced us. Her face was cracked and wrinkled more so than what he had imagined. Her mouth hung open, clearly not by choice, showing us the few teeth that remained. The ones that did were twisted and browned. Your daughter's family's here to see you, the old man said while slowly scooting her over to her chair and making her sit down. The blanket remained on while doing so. Is she supposed to be standing on her own like that? Aiden's mother asked. The old man shook his head. It's the darndest thing, really. She hadn't been able to stand for quite some time, but ever since last week, I have been finding her standing on her own, mainly facing the wall. My dad started to pipe in, but stopped. Well, let us get our stuff situated, and we can come and help you, his mother said. She led us outside and over to the truck. Once by the truck, Aiden's father piped up. Something's wrong with your mother. That didn't look like her, he said out of concern. Aiden's mom shot him a mean glance. Of course that didn't look like her. She's dying. Plus, it's been 10 years since you last saw her, but now you care? Both parents looked at me. Sorry, Aiden. This will be good for us. I know you don't know my mom very well, but this means a lot to me. His parents shared a brief glance before they both went inside while carrying bags. Aiden, you'll be taking my old room, his mom ordered while heading up the stairs. The stairs were dark. No candles lit the way, but his mother plunged through the darkness, leading him to the room. If you couldn't already tell, this home doesn't have electricity, she said without glancing at him. Once up the stairs, the small stream of light could be seen under the doors, lining the hallway. His mother opened the last door on the left, flooding the hallway with natural light. Let's keep this door open so we can see in the hallway, she said. In the room was a single mattress sitting on an old metal bed frame and a dresser. The room was bare. The single window sat unobstructed, filling the room with light from outside. The mattress was old and didn't have a sheet on it, but a single light blanket sat folded at the end of it. His mom sat on the bed and motioned for him to sit next to her. This was my room when I was a kid, his mother said softly. Much different than yours. He just looked at her with pleading eyes, begging her to not make him stay here. She looked away, knowing that she was asking a lot for her family, but her guilt-riddled conscience overruled. I'll make it up to you, I promise. I'll buy you any game system you want, just be the good boy that you are and help me get through this. She got up and left the room. Aiden unpacked his stuff and left the room, leaving the door open. The light from the room guided him back to the stairs and back to the main floor. 
He could hear his parents outside arguing, so he went back to the living room. In the corner of the room, he couldn't help but notice his father placing small logs in the furnace, a detail he didn't notice the first time he was there. He sat quietly in the back of the living room. The warm glow didn't reach far, nor did its heat. It didn't take long for night to come. Aiden's mom started working on dinner and instructed Aiden to light some candles. Aiden went around the house with matches, lighting whatever candles he could find. His father was busy brooding about, making it known that he did not want to be there. Once he finished lighting the candles on the main level, he made his way up the stairs. The home was much warmer now, thanks to the old man keeping the furnace going. The home began to brighten with each candle when Aiden reached the second level. He couldn't find any candles on the second level, so he just went to his room. The room was dark. The window, which gave the room its light, was now completely filled with darkness. Thankfully, Aiden found a small candle sitting on his bedside table that hadn't been lit in years. Once ignited, Aiden sat next to the candle and pulled out his switch again and began to play. The volume was still off. He played for a few minutes when he thought he heard something in the attic above him. It was a subtle sound, but it sounded deliberate, unlike the natural sounds of an old home settling out in the middle of nowhere. The sound that startled Aiden sounded like footsteps that were directly above him. He placed the switch down and grabbed the candle. The light only reached so far in the dark house. He peered outside his room and glanced in the empty walls. The wooden floors extended to the end of the hallway, and cheap wallpaper lined this miserable stretch of home. The creaks and groans of downstairs drowned out most of the noise. Only in his room was he able to hear the muffled sounds of something upstairs. Aiden was about to descend the stairs and go back to the main floor, hopefully bringing the strange noise to the attention of either parent. But something stood at the base of the stairs, staring up at him. At first, the cloaked figure startled him. He wasn't expecting his grandmother to be standing there, especially so creepily. Aiden was startled, but not afraid, at least at first. As he had descended the few stairs, his estranged grandmother made a bizarre gesture that caused him to stop. The old woman lifted an old and crooked finger to her wrinkled lips, followed by the sound of shh. Aiden was stunned. The sight alone was beginning to grow fear in him. Here stood an old and terrifying woman blocking the exit telling him to be quiet. This was a woman that shouldn't be able to stand, let alone make a choice to tell someone to be quiet. Uh, what? Aiden responded, hoping that the gesture was just a strange thing that she perhaps did due to her dementia or whatever it was that she had. But instead, the old woman lowered her finger and smiled wide. No one will believe you, she whispered. Chills shot through his body, now signaling fight or flight. Aiden took a step back up the stairs and went back to his room, praying that the woman wouldn't follow him. Once out of sight, he sprinted back to the room and closed the door. Aiden sat on the bed, shaking with fear. His adrenaline pumping thick in his system and his senses were heightened. He could hear quick footsteps coming up the stairs and over to his door. Oh no, he thought. Please don't, he whimpered pitifully. The door handle turned, opening the door revealing Aiden's mom on the other side. What's wrong, dear? She asked. A sigh of relief exited his body and a huge weight was lifted. Oh, mom, it's you. Grandma's acting strange. She was scaring me. The mother walked over to his bed and sat next to him. I know, dear, she said while embracing him. She's scaring me too in her condition. She wasn't always like this. Aiden tried to explain what had happened, but his mother cut him off. That's the hard thing with getting older. You see your loved ones slowly deteriorate and become these different people entirely. Thank you for being brave. She stroked his head a few times before standing up. It's time for dinner. I hope you're hungry. Aiden got up and followed his mother out of the room and down the stairs. Sitting at the table were both grandparents and his dad. None of them were talking around the candlelit table. 
Aiden tried to avoid contact with his grandmother as he sat down. Dinner went as expected. Very little conversation was had. Aiden peered a few times over to his grandmother to see that she wasn't even trying to eat, just staring at nothing. Dinner eventually ended, and everyone went their separate ways. It wasn't terribly late, but Aiden went to his room to call it a night. He wasn't tired, but he just wanted to get away from his creepy grandmother. Something about her was strange. Her dead stare, her mouth just hanging open, but mainly the encounter on the stairs, told him, even though for the slightest of moments, that she seemed to be aware of what she was doing. Aiden played quietly on his switch for the rest of the night, as the battery slowly died. The home was getting colder now. The furnace was no longer being attended to. Aiden wrapped himself up in a blanket and tried to find some sleep, but sleep would never come. The cold mix with the new environment made it difficult to shut his brain off. For some reason, unknown to Aiden, his brain was on high alert. Out of the silence of the cold, dark house came the same sound that he had heard earlier that day. The sound of someone walking above him in the attic. Initially, nothing too bizarre, but it did get his attention. Suddenly, a loud thud banged overhead, as if someone dropped something very heavy onto the floor. This startled Aiden. After a few minutes of staring at the ceiling, trying to listen to what was going on above him, a slow dripping could be heard coming from somewhere in the room. The hour was late. Everyone was probably asleep by now, but the dripping persisted. At first, the initial theory behind the drip was that it was raining and that the home needed a new roof. But a quick glance outside confirmed that the night was indeed dry. Aiden got up to turn on the lights, but remembered that the home didn't have electricity. Thankfully, he had left the book of matches by his candle in the room. A quick flick of the match illuminated the room. The small candle was lit and began burning the little wax that it had left. It didn't take long for Aiden to find the source of the drip. A pool of dark liquid gathered on the floor, most of which being absorbed by the wood. Aiden looked up to find a dark spot on the ceiling that was producing the drip. It then dawned on Aiden that the loud bang and the dripping were definitely related. This was not good. It wasn't so much that the dripping itself had concerned Aiden, but rather the collar. It was hard to tell in the orange candlelight, but if he didn't know any better, this liquid looked very much like blood. Before he could hop back into bed, a scream could be heard, although muffled, somewhere on the main floor. It sounded feminine in nature, most likely his mother. It had to be. Aiden's blood chilled at the sound, but quickly found himself leaving his room to investigate. He entered the dark hallway and creaked across the floors to the stairs. All the candles in the house were extinguished, making the old wooden home incredibly dark, save it be the one that he was holding. Aiden went down the stairs to where he thought he heard the scream. It just so happened that he was going in the direction of his mother's room. At that moment of rather poor fortune, the small candle that was guiding him went out. Oh no, he whispered. He placed the candle down and tried to find another, but realized he left all the matches upstairs. It was useless. He stood in the middle of the house in complete darkness, unsure of what to do. However, before he could decide on his own, he heard a shuffling and something heavy being dragged. Aiden felt around for anything to guide him away from the base of the stairs, and eventually felt a wall and then a knob. Aiden twisted the knob and entered the small closet that he had found. Old clothes and a broom pushed against him as he entered the closet and closed it partially. To his surprise, a soft glow entered his field of view as he saw an old man holding a candle walk past the door. For a brief moment, Aiden thought about exiting his hiding place, but his mind screamed at him. The old man walked by, this time escorting his wrinkled wife, but the scene that laid before him paralyzed him with fear. His grandmother was no longer wearing the blanket that concealed most of her body. This time, she was exposed, revealing that her true form was something much more sinister. The grandmother's shape was no longer human, not even close. 
The face of the grandmother looked the same, but everything else looked demonic in nature. Her size was much bigger. But it wasn't the size or the features of the grandmother that scared him so much, but rather what she was holding. Dragging behind the grandmother was what little remained of Aiden's mom. Slashes covered the body and several limbs were missing. The grandmother was dragging Aiden's lifeless mother by the hair and went up the stairs. Streaks of rich blood trailed behind, leaving a morbid reminder of what had happened only moments before. Go ahead and put this with the other one in the attic, the old man said. I'll take care of the kid. Aiden wanted to cry for help, but knew that his father surely had met a similar fate. The old man and the creature pretending to be his grandmother went up the stairs, dragging the remains. Small thuds could be heard as torn flesh went up each stair. Once they were out of view, Aiden left his hiding spot and went to the front door. A quick attempt on the front knob revealed that the door was in fact locked. Aiden silently went to any possible opening to try to free himself from this realm of horror, but all potential exits were tightly sealed. Aiden began to cry, seeing how escape wasn't an option. He knew that the only way to free himself was to fight his way out. Aiden's eyes had slowly adjusted to the dark, and he went to find a weapon. His 12-year-old body was no match for the horrifying beast hand to hand. But perhaps, if he found a large enough knife or a weapon to level the playing field, then, and only then, did he stand a chance. Aiden slowly made his way to the living room. The dull glow of the embers dying in the furnace gave enough light to reveal a fire poker made from some rusted iron laid near the furnace. Aiden quickly went over and picked up the poker, feeling its hefty weight. Its wooden handle was worn, but gripped tightly against his hand. Aiden knew that he must take on the old man first, then the creature. He certainly couldn't take on both at once. The thought briefly came across his mind that perhaps the old man was also a creature in disguise. If this was the case, then he was surely dead. The sound of someone frantically pacing above and eventually descending the stairs creaked throughout the house. Aiden quickly tried to find a hiding place, but no suitable option presented itself. A glow streamed from the other room, and it began to get brighter, indicating to Aiden that the old man was coming. He hid behind the entryway of the room and readied his weapon to swing with all his might. His hands continued to sweat as the figure then entered the room. Aiden swung, hitting the old man square in the head, knocking him over. The old man dropped the candle, which nearly extinguished the light. The surprise attack was successful. The old man laid in pain as his head began to bleed from its recent crack, but the old man was not dead. It was enough to knock him over, sure, but there was still enough life in him to fight back. The old man was disoriented, but tried to get back up. Aiden swung again, this time hitting him in a less vital area. The man fell again but tried almost instantly to grab the poker from Aiden. Aiden continued to swing until the old man lay lifeless on the ground. Little remained of his face and head as Aiden made sure that his attacker would never get up. A quick check of the old man's body confirmed that he did not have a key to any of the doors. He would need to face this creature head on. Quick movements from upstairs told him that he needed to hide. Aiden took his same hiding spot from before, but just out of view in the doorway. A mixture of tears and blood splattered covered his face as he readied the same poker. This time, the grip was much more slippery. He gripped with both hands, ready to render the monster's flesh into pulp, much like its accomplice, but the creature never did come down the stairs. Aiden waited for a few moments, his adrenaline still pumping through his body, when he began to notice that the candle that the old man had dropped had started to catch the wooden floor on fire. He debated only briefly to pick up the candle and to extinguish the flame, but then it dawned on him. The chances of him actually killing this thing were unknown. If he were to die, he wanted to make sure that this thing would go with him. He let the candle burn, continuing its spread across the floor and onto the walls. Tired of waiting, Aiden went up the stairs to confront the beast. The glow from downstairs shined through the room and up partially to the second floor. 
Aiden's gut told him to follow the blood trail. Surely at the other end, he would find his only source of escape. The blood led from the stairs down the hall to another set of stairs, leading up to the attic. The attic received no light from the burning house. Aiden went to his room, grabbed his switch, and turned it on to the home screen as a light source. In the room, the dripping from above had a steady stream of blood, dripping from the ceiling and walls. The monster must have put the bodies in the attic, right above his room, which would explain the blood trail. The flash of the switch reflected off the window, reminding him that the second story room had a window, aka a way out. It then dawned on him that his exit was right in front of him. Without thinking, Aiden smashed the window with the poker, notifying to whoever remained in the house of his location. Loud footsteps were heard above him as he cleared the window of its glass. Smoke now filled most of the house and flames began consuming most of the main floor. The window was clear and Aiden had crouched through the window to free himself when a loud bang was heard on his room's door. The creature began to beat the door in almost effortlessly. A head-on battle with this beast would surely end his life almost instantly. Aiden was halfway through the window when the door splintered open. The large beast entered the room, seeing its last remaining prey trying to flee, and lunged its massive talon-filled claw at Aiden. The swipe struck his side, pushing him out the window. Aiden cried from the pain and fell landing awkwardly outside. He landed flat on his back and heard a loud crack. His body exploded with pain. Fearing for his life, he looked up to the window to see the creature trying to follow him, but the window was too small. Aiden tried to stand, but could no longer feel his legs. Blood began to flow freely from his side as his encounter with the beast came at a high price. The house was now burning as the smoke filled the air. Shrieks from inside hurt his ears as he knew that he was slowly killing the beast. He laid on the ground and continued to bleed. No one was coming to save him. This house was too far off that even a mountain of flames would not be able to notify anyone. He just lay there, streams of tears on his face. The screams from inside eventually stopped, and for Aiden's last few moments, he produced a small smile, knowing that he had killed the thing that had killed his family. Aiden continued to smile as his vision slowly faded away. Jason drove his F-150 on the dark highway. It was late. He and his girlfriend just got in a serious fight, which was most likely their last. He was driving north to stay with his brother at his house. Jason's brother, Tommy, was a good guy. They were pretty close, despite the couple hours drive between them. Tommy had just moved out of the city and bought his first house in a developing neighborhood. Jason checked the time to see that it was one in the morning. The highway was mostly empty, save it be the occasional semi. Jason hadn't been to Tommy's new place yet. Apparently, part of it was still under renovations, but the house itself was practically finished. His phone was set up to the address on the GPS and was listening to some horror podcast. Jason had been at work all day and was tired. The highway lines would occasionally blur, letting him know that he needed to take another hit of his energy drink. Jason had been driving for some time, the GPS had him arriving in under an hour, which due to the surrounding trees of the highway, made it seem longer. Finally, his exit arrived. Jason took the exit, trying his best to focus. The GPS then led him on a paved road that seemed to cut the forest in half. On both sides of the road were thick trees and darkness. The stories that he was listening to were beginning to hit harder the deeper he drove into the woods. It got to the point that Jason had to turn them off. A brief glance at the GPS told him that he had another 40 minutes left when something quickly entered his headlight beams. It was so quick and Jason was so tired that he only had an instant to swerve, which he failed to do. Hitting head on whatever darted in front of his truck, he began to fishtail and decelerate it off to the side of the road. Jason got out, now fully awake, fearing that he had damaged his truck. He quickly inspected what had jolted him awake. Fur and blood splattered across the front end and bits of whatever it was still hung in his grill. A foul stench emitted from the remnants of the animal. What did I hit? 
he asked angrily. Jason went inside his truck, grabbed his phone, and turned on the flashlight. He then exited his truck and backtracked to whatever it was that caused so much damage. Laying in the middle of the road was a wolf or a large coyote. Jason didn't know the difference. The body was lifeless, however, something about this creature captured Jason's attention. He had seen and even killed his fair share of wild game back in the day, but something about this was so bizarre. For whatever reason, perhaps it was because he was so tired, he decided to drag the creature to his truck and put it in the back of his bed. His father was a big hunter and thought that something this size would look great stuffed and placed in his hunting room. Jason tried starting his truck, but oddly enough, the truck wouldn't turn over. You've got to be kidding me, Jason mumbled as he tried the key again. Still, the engine would not turn over. Jason checked the GPS and it said that he had roughly 28 minutes from his brother's house. His brother worked in construction and had a nice work truck that he would use to carry various machinery around at different work sites. Jason called his brother who answered quite groggily. Are you close? Tommy answered. Yeah, I'm close, Jason responded. Hey, look, I had something on the way over to your house and now my truck won't start. Can you come by and tow me back to your place? Jason bleated. Tommy was frustrated. First, he called to come over so late, now he needed to be towed? Tommy was about to give him a piece of his mind, but decided against it. Fine, but you owe me big time, he replied. Thank you so much, dude. Oh, by the way, I have a surprise for you when you get here. I'll send you a pen to come get me, and I'll see you soon. Tommy hung up the phone and got his truck ready to tow back his brother. His phone went off indicating a text from Jason. A quick check confirmed that it was a pen showing his last location. Tommy plugged into the GPS and took off into the night. The 28 minutes slowly passed as he fought the urge to fall asleep and yawned almost the entire way. Tommy finally arrived at Jason's truck and saw that the front end was pretty damaged. Dang, he wasn't kidding. Tommy backed up the truck to the front of Jason's and got out and began hooking up the truck. But as he was hooking up the truck, he noticed that Jason was nowhere to be seen. Tommy looked around to try to find him when a quick glance inside revealed a bloody interior. The driver's seat was torn up, and fresh blood still dripped from the sides and ceiling of the truck. What? Tommy stood back. Tommy began to dial 911 when he heard what sounded like his brother off into the woods. Tommy, I'm over here. Tommy glanced into the woods and shined his phone in that direction. The woods revealed nothing but twisted trees and darkness. Hey dude, I'm not in the mood for your games. Get out here or I'm leaving you, Tommy replied, but no answer. Frustrated, Tommy continued to hook up the truck to his hitch when he heard another voice, this time on the other side of the road. I have a surprise for you over here. Tommy stopped what he was doing this time, much more concerned. He then went back to his phone and called the police while waiting inside his truck. An operator answered, 911, what's your emergency? Hi, my name's Tommy and I'm on Richmond Road, about 15 minutes from Triton. I think my brother has been in an accident and is greatly hurt. Please send out assistance. The operator confirmed the location and verified what emergency services he needed. Definitely bring paramedics and just for safekeeping, send a police unit just in case. Tommy hung up the phone and waited in his truck. He was unsure the time it was going to take for the paramedics to arrive. He didn't feel safe out on the road so late at night and felt as if something was off. Inside the truck, he heard a voice, this time sounding nothing like his brother. I have a surprise for you. Tommy looked back and saw a figure by the truck. Fearing his brother had some type of head injury or was gravely injured, he got out to help. At the same time, a siren could be heard coming down the road. That brief moment distracted Tommy causing him to look in the other direction, and then back at the figure, but it was gone. A police cruiser pulled up and two officers got out. What's going on here? One of the officers asked. I'm glad you guys are here. My brother got in a small crash, but I can't seem to find him. I keep hearing him out in the woods, but he keeps hiding from me. 
I think he's concussed or something. The officers looked at one another with looks of fear. I'm really worried about him. His driver's seat's full of blood. The officers told him to quickly unhook his truck, get it and drive it home, and that they would call him as soon as they found his brother. They called in for more backup and waited in their cruisers. Tommy worried for his brother's safety, but listened to the officers. Tommy went home scared for his brother's condition. He waited all the next day for a phone call from the police, or even from his brother, but it never came. The police finally called him down to the station in town for questioning two days later. After a brief series of questions, seeing how he was no longer a suspect, the officers then filled in Tommy with the situation. They found Jason's body, dead about 15 minutes away into the woods. The events of his death and how he died raised more questions than it did answers. His body was found mangled and torn, much as if wildlife had gotten a hold of him, but that wasn't the concerning part. The part that worried the officers was that Jason was decapitated. Even that fact alone would be something that the police could write off as an animal, but it's where they found his head that was concerning. His head was found 20 yards away, stuck on a small log, standing upright. His face held a look of terror, as his last moments were surely horrifying, making the mystery all the more confusing. The officers then asked if his brother had said anything to him that might indicate what had happened to him, but Tommy was stumped. He mentioned that he had hit something with his truck, and that he had a surprise for him, but that was it, making the case even more cryptic. Tommy felt sick to his stomach, but worse than that, confused by everything that had happened. What did Jason crash into? Who had killed him? And what was the surprise that he wanted to show me? <laughs>